Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Glory be to God. This is the day the Lord has made. So can I hear you rejoice and be glad? If you're expecting great things to happen this day to you, can I hear you rejoice and be glad? If you know this is not just another day, can I hear you rejoice and be glad? If you are getting a revelation of the Father's love for you, can I hear you rejoice and be glad? Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. This is the best place to be. Amen. 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 The Father's Love Language is part two. Okay. So, we talked about the Father's Love Language is part one last week. We said the term love language refers to the way a person prefers to express love to and receive it from a partner. The term is often used to refer to many different methods of expressing love. It was introduced by Dr. Gary Chapman, who proposed five love languages, and we're not going into those. But we're not talking about love languages with one another today. We're talking about our love languages with God the Father, because our relationship with him is a love relationship. Amen. Amen. So God, the Father, has love languages. There are ways he expresses his love to us, and there are ways he wants us to express our love to him. And just like in a relationship with a partner, if you know the way your partner expresses love, you can recognize when they are loving you. If you know the way your partner likes to receive love, you can recognize when, how to give love to them. Amen. Amen. All right. So we began from the first part, which is how the Father expresses his love to us. And the very first point we looked at was God loves us exactly. I can hear you. God loves us exactly as much as he loves Jesus. We said under that, the same love with which he loves Jesus is the same quality of love, the same with which he loves you. And I hope you spend time to meditate these truths from last Sunday. I hope you didn't just listen to it last Sunday and think you got it. You've got to play these messages over and over again and keep listening to get it. Amen. As long as he loves Jesus, he will never stop loving you. For as long as he has loved Jesus, is for as long as he has loved you. And as long as Jesus is seated by his side in heavenly places, so are you. Amen. So today we'll look at the second love language of the Father, how he wants to express his love to us, and that is this. God's love is expressed sacrificially towards you. God's love is expressed sacrificially towards you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we've taught you here before that the Greek actually says it this way, for this is how God loved the world. That's actually the proper rendition of that verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave, colon, this is how he did it. He gave his, only, uh, his one and only son that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Sacrificially, that's how God loves you. Sacrificially, that's how he expresses his love towards you. What is a sacrifice? It is an act of giving up something 
for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. You're giving up something precious, actually, for the sake of something else that you consider important, more important, or worthy. So begin to think about that when we say that God loves you sacrificially. He expressed his love towards you sacrificially. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. That's great sacrificial love. So let's write down the first point under this. In expressing his sacrificial love towards you in Christ, God did not consider himself at all. In expressing his sacrificial love towards you in Christ, God did not consider himself at all. At all. This is the utmost definition of sacrifice. He did not consider himself. He was not in the equation of his decision to give his only son. Your word and only son. Your only begotten son. Your son whom you love so much and you give him up. He did not consider himself at all. He did not consider what could have been his loss at all. That is how much God loves you. He puts you first. Amen. Say after me, God did not consider himself at all in loving me. You know, even when we love people, many times we think of ourselves. There's a bit of a consideration to either how they would feel or how it would make us look. There's some consideration to yourself. But God did not consider himself at all. Look at this verse of scripture. Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I mean, these two verses are so packed. So let's just look at some things there. If he says, he who did not spare his own son, does that suggest to you that he could have spared his son? Hello? I wouldn't say um, somebody could have done something or somebody did not do something if that person could not have done it. So if it says he did not spare his own son, it means he was in a position to spare his son, but he did not do it. It means it was possible. It actually shows you, really, he was the only one that could have stopped what was happening, but he did not do it. Now, wait a minute. If that was the case, and he's the one that could have spared his son but did not do it, and he stood by, he was the one able to stop what was going on. He chose not to do it. He stood by and watched somebody else afflict his son. Wouldn't that be bad enough? Hello? Wouldn't that be bad enough? But that's not what he was. Not only was he the one who could have stopped it, and he chose not to. He was the one who delivered him up for us. He was the one who gave him up for us. Not that he was watching somebody else do it, and he could have stopped it, but he did not. He did not consider himself at all. It was you on his mind. I didn't say it was us on his mind. Because... If you were the only singular person that needed salvation, he would have done exactly the same thing just for you. If it was only you, so it wasn't a group um, wholesale arrangement. Your salvation is not wholesale. We make more money from wholesale. If we do retail, there are more risks. Mm -mm. If it was only you, he would have done exactly the same thing. If we look at that word, 
spare, we begin to get a deeper look at what this means. He did not consider himself at all. That word spare is a Greek word, phidomai. Forget about the word. And it means to be cherry of, C-H-A-R-Y. I've looked at this word before. Okay? I didn't know this word until I, I saw this definition some time ago. And then I checked the, the meaning in English. To be cherry of. Cherry means cautiously or suspiciously. Listen, listen. Reluctant to do something. So like cautious. You know, I want to check. To be cherry of. To abstain or to treat leniently. To forbear. To spare. Now listen. That's what, that, that's what it means to spare. But he says he did not spare. What does that tell you? To spare means to be cherry of, to be cautious, to be careful, to be lenient. But the Bible says he did not spare. What does that tell you? What does that tell you, church? Is English too much for you? Should I come back to pitching? To spare means to be cherry of. To be cherry means to be cautious, careful, hesitant. But he did not spare. What does that tell you? Huh? I can't hear you. He couldn't care less. He couldn't care less. He was heedless. He was... He, in fact... It's like he did it with Gragra. Gra. He just did it. He didn't say, hey, sorry, Jesus, you know, I, I, we have to afflict you for this thing to happen. So just manage it. He did not spare his son. And he was the one that delivered him. And he delivered him aggressively. He delivered him without caring what anybody thought about what he was doing. He did not consider himself. You are the only consideration in his expressing his love for you. That's almost too much to, to take in. You can only take it in by revelation. It's almost too much. It makes me, oh, literally brings me to tears each time I think about it. He didn't spare his son. For me, for me, like it was only me. If you're going to climb a stage and you're not sure how the stage is, this is how you put your leg, isn't it? If you see a chair that doesn't look very strong, you will test it before you put your whole weight on it. That's what it means to be cherry. You're careful. There was no testing. There was no testing. He went full blast at Jesus. Each time you see that word spare used, most times it's used in a, in a, in a way that will frighten you. Let me, let me read a few things to you, just for you to begin to see a picture of what God did for you. In Philip's translation, by the way, reads, reads verse 31 this way. In face of all this, what is there left to say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He that did not hesitate to spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How can we not trust such a God? Let's leave that version. Look at this. Look at this, please. I want to show you the places where spare is used. Just for you to see a picture of spare. Second Peter 2, 4. If God did not spare the angels who sins, but cast them down to where? To where? Are you awake this morning? To where? He did not spare them and cast them down to hell. Just to show you the context in which that word is used most times. Very frightening element to it, according to Mouse. Look at this one again. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, he didn't spare the ancient world. What happened to them? The flood. So he watched 
the angels who sinned, cast them down to hell. He didn't spare them. He watched the ancient world and the flood consumed them. That's what it means not to spare. He did not spare his son. He did not spare his son for you. Amen. Amen. He didn't spare him of what? Let's read Isaiah 53 and let's see the full extent of what I like to call the savage, brutal wrath. The savage, brutal wrath that he was delivered unto for you and he was not spared of. Isaiah 53, from the Living Bible. I'll just pick up from verse 3, maybe. We despised him. It's a very graphic picture. We despised him and rejected him, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. When he went by, he was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our grief he bore, our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and bruised for us. Somebody with a stomach condition is getting healed by the power of God. Wherever you are, whoever you are, just receive that healing. I don't know what the stomach condition is, but it stops now in the name of Jesus. But he was wounded and bruised for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was lashed and we are healed. We, every one of us, have strayed away like sheep. We who left God's paths to follow our own. Yet God laid on him, God laid on him, God laid on him the guilt and sins of every one of us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he never said a word. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers is dumb. So he stood silent before the ones condemning him. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. And it goes on at the end. He had done no wrong. He had never spoken an evil word. But it was the Lord's good plan. It was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and fill him and fill him with grief. Why would he do that? To save you from exactly the same thing. To save you from the same brutal wrath. To save you from the same anger. Let me tell you this and get this today. God is not angry with you. God is not angry with you. Stop looking over your shoulder and thinking there is a God who is angry with you. God is not angry with you. Look at your neighbor and say, God is not angry with you. God knows they vex for you. He loves you too much. He poured everything on Jesus so you don't have to carry it. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. That is liberating news. God is not angry with us. And get this, church. Don't think for one minute that Jesus was forced to do this. Jesus was not forced to do this. So again, back to our image. It's not like God was the one who could have saved him. He didn't save him. He, now he watched somebody else afflict him. He was the one, and as he was doing it, no, I don't want to do this. Father, leave me. No, you must do it. I'm your I'm the father. I love the people more than you. There was no struggle. You read it in Isaiah 53. There was no struggle. He was quiet. He was silent. So don't for one minute think that there was any res resistance from Jesus. There wasn't. He aligned fully with the plan of God. He aligned fully with what God was doing. He took it all willingly for you. Glory be to God. God did not consider himself. Doesn't the Bible say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And all of the things he did, he went fully obedient to the cross without thinking about anybody else but you. It means he didn't look at God and wonder why the Father 
whom he had been with from the foundation of the world, was betraying him. He did not see what God did as a betrayal. He was fully aligned with the sacrifice and the plan of God. Glory be to God. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves you. Religion won't tell you that, but it's the Bible. That's the simple truth of how much God loves you. God Almighty, creator of the universe, Alpha and Omega, the one we sang about today, he did not consider himself a loving, unimportant little you. Amen. Second one, in expressing this sacrificial love towards you in Christ. So the first one, in expressing his love sacrificially towards you, he did not consider himself. Two, in expressing his sacrificial love towards you in Christ, God states that he has publicly taken sides with you. Glory be to God. Somebody did not hear me say that. God states that he has publicly taken sides with you. God is declaring to anybody who cares to listen that you have his vote. I didn't say he has your vote. You have his vote. He has taken sides with you publicly. Romans 8, again, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, we quote all these scriptures many times as Christians on Sunday morning. Then we go out on Monday and somebody goes, huh, and we do, hey. You forget this. Somebody just goes, huh, and you go, hey. Why? If God is for you, who? I ask you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? Look at it from, look at it from the Kenneth Wu's translation. What then shall we say to these things? In view of the fact that God is on our behalf, who could be against us? In view of the fact, to so put that in front of you, that God is on your behalf, I want to know who could possibly successfully be against you. Who? <laughs> Listen to me, child of God. Church, God is for you. The Son is for you. The Spirit is for you. The entire Godhead is for you. Think it. God is for you. It's all in Romans 8. God is for you. We just saw that in Romans 8, 31. Look at verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, listen, is also risen who is even at the right hand of God having coffee. Who is even at the right hand of God taking a snack. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. The Son is for you. The Father is for you. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes what? Intercession for us. God is for us. Christ, as I speak right now, is, who says, is constantly interceding for Nkechi. Constantly interceding for Bash. So even if anybody tries to come against Bash, God is on his side. The, the son is seated, constantly interceding for Bash. The spirit in Bash 
is making intercession for Bash. <clears throat> the entire Godhead is for you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit for you. Who can be against you? Who? Make Tabruskia. Who? Who has been created that can be against you? Who in that office can be against you? Who in your family can be against you? Who in your husband's family can be against you? Who in your wife's family can be against you? Who in your community can be against you? God who created that person is for you. On your behalf. Why do you fear any man? Why do you fear what man can do to you? Why do you speak about what men threaten you with and repeat lies when the father who created them is for you? By what God did in not sparing his son and delivering him, he was telling the heavens, the earth, and beneath the earth that he's on your side. And he didn't hide to do it. He was not ashamed of you. The simple truths I want to remind you of. Because sometimes we get so deep in quotes that we forget the truths that got us where we are. Somebody said the Godhead is for me. The entire Godhead is for me. But you know, there's something that this tells me. When the Father publicly is stating that he's for you, apart from the life of his son, which is the sacrifice, do you know there's something else he puts at stake and at risk? At risk in loving you. The Father is for you. Okay, question. Who were you as the Father did that for you? Huh? Loud. A sinner. Let's give some examples of this sinner. Sinner man, a sinner man, a sinner man. Such as a... Somebody said fornication. That's always the first one. Modra, fornicator, kidnapper, liar. Hey, let's, you see, you see, all this modra, I don't believe there's any modra here. Fornicator, there are only ex fornicators here. Some might be last night, but it's ex. Because it won't happen again in the name of. So there are only ex fornicators here. So that when you be saying them, them, let's bring it to our seat. Liar. You know that malice. Backbiter. Backbiter. Wow. <laughs> Backbiter. Eh? Gossip, unforgiveness. Is your seat getting small hot now? Mm? Because when you say modra, all those things, you sound like them, them. Inside, to thinking about the things that you have left. So listen, murderer, fornicator, liar, backbiter, fornicator. Have I said fornicator before? Now nah, that fornication thing is a problem. <laughs> Drug pusher, <laughs> Bag selfishness, all those things. Malice. You know when you and your wife will be in the house, you not talk to yourselves. Malice, strife, all those things. Then God. We describe the sinner. Who is God? Holy, righteous, huh? stainless, stainless. Not that he was stained and then he cleaned up himself. Stainless, holy, pure, righteous, light. That's who God is. Next question. 
Does everybody know that God is that? Did, don't the angels know? Didn't the heavens know? Huh? Good. Then this God that is pure, holy, righteous, stainless, light, publicly identifies himself with murderer, fornicator, liar, gossip, strife, nyama nyama. What did he put at stake in that sacrifice for you? His reputation. His reputation. Who you identify with can, ident can affect what people think about you. It's called association. If I see you hanging out with certain people, I will assume you are like them. If I want to know you, all of you guys, chiking ladies, before you enter prayer and fasting, check out her friends. Who are her friends? Who is she comfortable around? You don't need to pray and fast too much. Her friends will tell you a lot about her. Silence in the house. Same thing. Who are his friends? Pastor, he doesn't really have any friends. He's hiding them from you. He has friends. Who are his friends? That's the power of association. God put his reputation at stake in publicly loving you. The holy, pure, righteous, stainless light. While you are yet a stinking sinner, he loved you. When we say that God did not consider himself, and God made a statement that he's on your side publicly, he put his reputation at risk. How many of you will put your reputation at, at stake for someone like that? It's tough. Even as Christians, we find it difficult to do that. We're checking. I know, no, I know say we'll be Christian, but man, I can't, I can't hang around this person. No. He used to be this. This is not how he used to be. You were that. So why would you think that God will stop loving you after he has made you righteous? Maybe you slipped and you fell. You were already rotten and he loved you. Why do you think he will abandon you now? Amen. Look at this. Romans 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time, God died for the ungodly. Everybody say without strength. And they say ungodly. That's who you were. Now look at verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. Scarcely for a righteous man. That word scarcely is a word that means with difficulty, with much work. The Phillips puts it this way. In human experience, it is a rare thing for one man to give his life for another, even if the latter be a good man, though there have been a few who have had the courage to do it. That's human experience. With difficulty, will somebody die for someone? Maybe a good man. Even that is with difficulty. That's verse 7. Scarcely for... Scarcely. With difficulty. This is the way a human would do it. But what does verse 8 say? What does verse 8 say? Romans 5, 8. I want you to read it together. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You are not shouting. I don't know why you are whispering. I don't know why I cannot hear you now. Pump up the volume. But what? But God. But God. But God. I like that word, but too. 
I say I like that word, but when you see but, check what is turning around. But is turning something around. In human experience, this is done with difficulty for a good man. But God, but God is not human. In human experience, look at what happens to it's scarcely with difficulty. If you see a righteous man, maybe be safe. It's hard. You may even, maybe, you may have courage to die for a righteous. But God didn't wait for you to be righteous. But God demonstrated his love towards you while you were yet a sinner. But God. So when you see people who tell you, I want to be, I'm not, I can't come to God the way I am when I clean up a bit. They've not read this. They don't know this. Turn to your neighbor and say, but God. Tell the other person, but God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. He loved you right in your mess. Regardless of what anyone thought about his choice of you. Some of us know who we were before we got born again. Even though you try to forget, you can remember the kind of things you did, but God. I love it. Same way you read, but God, who is rich in mercy. But God demonstrated his love. But God, when he turns around things, he puts a but in your life. Amen. Glory be to God. You see Jesus express this love language throughout the scriptures. Who can think of examples of when this happened? We're talking about the love language of expressing your love sacrificially and in doing that, not caring what anybody thinks about your reputation. Jesus showed that love language to us. Who can remember any examples? Give me one. Huh? Huh? The Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is one example. So let me read what the Bible tells us about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Luke 19. He was a chief tax collector. He was a sinner man. Jesus looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Who was Zacchaeus? A chief tax collector. And he made haste, listen, and came down and received him joyfully, but when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. They began to judge Jesus. Zacchaeus, give me another example. Alabaster box, Abby. Good. Look at, look at um, Luke 7. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner... When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet, a sinner, and Jesus didn't chase her away, and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, hmm, this man... If he were a prophet, he would know what and who and what manner of woman who is touching him, for she's a sinner. But Jesus publicly identified himself with her. When the woman was caught in adultery, another woman caught, the Bible says, in the act of adultery. They brought her out, wanted to stone her. Jesus stood for her and came out and stood for her. Woman, where are your accusers? Go. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That is how much God is willing to stake his reputation in loving you. So when you see churches where a prostitute walks in, looking like a prostitute, and they want to clean her out, they don't know this love. I said they don't know this love. Some churches, a, do a drug pusher walks in, looking like a drug pusher, walking like this. And the ushers usher him out of the church. He doesn't look good enough for the optics. The camera might catch him. 
They don't know the scripture. That's not the love of God. The love of God doesn't care about its reputation. I actually wish more pastors would express love this way. I wish more church leaders, I wish more leaders would express this love. Let me show you what it says in another translation. Romans 5, 8. Listen to this translation very well from the message. Listen. But God put his love, but God put his love on the line, listen, by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use to him whatsoever. While we were of no use whatever to him. Think about it. He loved you publicly. When you are of no use, you are useless. So there was nothing you were going to contribute to his life. You come into church, there is nothing I can see you are going to contribute to this church by sight. I look at you when you come in, you are wretched, you are broken, you are busted, you are bad news. Why love you? Why accept you? Because that's that's the father's love language. That's the language he speaks. And every under shepherd who's representing him must speak the same language. I've seen some of you now who are, who are great ministers, partners, contributions come from you, your skills, your talents in the church. But I know what you were like 20 years ago. Don't forget that when you are of no use whatsoever to God, he accepted you. Some of you get to a point you forget. Because now a certain part of the church seemingly can't function without you. Then you become too important for yourself. No, 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 no. He loved you when you are of no use. So whatever use you think you have now, he gave it to you. You are useless to him. Useless. You are a liability. And he loved you publicly. You are bad news for him. Bad news for the church. Bad news for his name. He loved you like that. And defended you. Imagine being caught in adultery on the act. And the pure, stainless, righteous one, the holy light, came out. I said, well, let, let me see who can accuse her. Ah, are you supporting adultery? Are you supporting sin? No. I'm speaking my father's love language. But God, but God, the love of God, like a radar, targets the sinner. The love of God doesn't look for anyone who thinks they are righteous. He won't find you. It's programmed to connect with the sinner. Even if you think you're righteous, the day you come to a realization that you need Jesus, you'll find that love. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. We need to get this. Pastors, leaders, no use. You can't love people because you think you zone them out and think they have something to contribute. Mm. Mighty men are made out of discouraged, depressed, discontent people who receive the love of God. That's how you make mighty men. And that's the story of some of you here. Don't forget it. No wonder the Bible says in Ephesians 1 that you have been accepted in the beloved. That's what his love has done for you. Publicly accepted you. So can you stop today from seeking acceptance from other people? Can you stop measuring how good you are by how somebody else accepts you? It's good to be accepted. It's wonderful. Even if pastor, everybody accepts you. But you know what? Even if nobody accepts you, 
you're accepted in the beloved. I mean, that's not, those are not just words. Publicly, God is on your side. The Godhead is for you. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. That's an unchangeable truth. God has fully accepted you in him. So look at Romans 5, 8 again. God demonstrates his love towards us. Demonstrates. I want to show you that word demonstrates. It means to introduce favorably. The King James says commendeth. To recommend, listen, to recommend to favorable attention. To recommend to favorable attention. To place in a striking point of view. God took you out of the mess and recommended you. I recommend this one for favor. You didn't hear me. I recommend this one for favor. I take this one and I put this one in a striking point of view. I am the one recommending this one. If I recommended you for favor, you say, hey, Pastor Ketch recommended me for favor. Praise God, I honor and respect my... No, no, it's not me. No, God demonstrated his love. God recommended you for favorable attention. When you walk into a job interview, know that you have already been recommended by God for favor. You will not be afraid. God has placed you in a strike. You know, sometimes God makes you look good. And you know it's not you. You know it's not you. You just come in, everybody's, you know, all around you. Don't think it's you for a minute. God has put something on you. Placed you in a striking point of view. It's not your dress, it's not your hair. It's something on top of you. From the Father. Amen. That's what he's done. Right on the last point. My time is three more minutes. In expressing his sacrificial love towards you in Christ, God announces that he sees something in you that others may not see. God announces that he sees something in you that others may not see. Why would God do all these things we've talked about today? Why would he love you and not put himself into consideration at all? Why would he risk his reputation? Why would he cast his vote for you while you are a sinner? Why would he do all those things? When you are of no use whatsoever to him. Don't you think there must be something he knows about you. There is something, I was a sinner. God did all of these things aggressively towards me because God knows some, God saw me today. God sees me 10 years from now. There's something God knows about you. Do you know why I know that? Number one, God will never replace you. All those ancestors that tell you, hey, see, it's your grandmother has come back. Oh. You two like Mumu, you'll be repeating it. This is my new baby. Hi. Oh, you didn't name too much. <laughs> Try. Then you name the child your mother's name. You are quietly accepting reincarnation. You're insulting your baby. So you're insulting your baby. God will never replace you. Even if you were, he will never replace you. God will not create another you. There's no another you again he will create. So there's something he sees in you. The challenge is, if you accept his love, unless you accept his love, you won't see that thing that he sees in you. It is with the eyes of his love he sees that thing in you. Other, may, others may see a sinner girl. Jesus saw a preacher woman. 
Others may see a depressed, busted person. Jesus saw someone who counsels people and gives them hope. What does God see about you? Why would he make this level of sacrifice? Why would he make this huge investment in you? Sometimes we need to ask ourselves these questions. So when circumstances want to make you look down on yourself, mm -mm. you're not a worthless cause. You are a worthy investment to him. Even when you are of no use whatsoever, there is something he saw in you. Why did he see that thing? Well, just like Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you prophet to the nations. Do you know why God, <laughs> when everybody else is seeing rubbish, cinnamon, everybody else is seeing yama yama, of no use whatsoever. Do you know why God persists in loving you? Because he knows what he puts inside you. His love is basically a GPS going back to find what he placed in you. He knows what he puts. He knows it's there. He knows he put the call inside me. So no matter where I was, his love pursued me and tracked me down. Because he believed in that thing he put inside me. Even when I didn't know it was there. That's what his love does. A revelation of his love solves every inferiority, solves every identity crisis, solves every problem. But many times we focus on the fact that we can see that we have no use to God. We have no use to the church. We have no use to anybody. No, no, no. Before you were born, when you were in your mother's womb, I placed something inside you. All that God sees in you is glory. That's it, it's glory. He doesn't see shame. He doesn't see failure. Because he did not put that in you. He will only see what he put. And he created you. Satan did not create you. Condition did not create you. Circumstance did not form you. The one who created you knows what he put in you. He says, the captain of our salvation, bringing many sons unto what? Glory. He says, he took you from the miry clay, took you from the donkey, rather, and brought you what? To inherit the throne of glory. It's glory. It's glory. It's glory. I said, it's glory. It's glory. God's destiny for me is Glory. God's destiny for you is glory. His love is bringing you to glory. His love is bringing this church to glory. His love is bringing your family to glory. His love is bringing your business to glory. His love is, that is his destination for you because glory is what he planted in you. He didn't plant any other thing. <laughs> he didn't. Church, God loves you. God loves you with a sacrificial love. God loves you. He didn't put himself first. God loves you. God loves you. You. He loves you. It's okay. He loves you. 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 If you're the only one, he loves you. God loves you. God loves you. You, yeah. You. Yeah, he loves you. He's not ashamed of you. God is happy to identify with you. Say, but I'm not good enough. I'm not even, I'm not, even, I'm not really a serious Christian. I wanted to, I've been trying to be serious. No, 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 no. You were a sinner and he recommended you for favorable attention. You were a sinner. Whatever you are now, even if you're a useless saint, you're not a sinner. If you're a lazy saint, you're not a sinner. If you're not yet committed, you're not a sinner. You can never, listen, listen, listen. You can never get as bad as you were when God first loved you.
when his love hits you, he turns you around. So whatever mistakes you are making now cannot get you back to where you were before his love found you. You are yet, you are a sinner, but God loved you. Now his love is going to train you up if you receive it. Lift your hands and worship you. Let me see the hands of people that God loves. I pray for you. I pray for everyone whose hands are lifted up. I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be opened up wide. I pray that these truths will be implanted. They will become the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I pray that you have a turnaround in your concept of who you are and how valued you are to the Father. I pray that light will flood your soul. Flood it. Flood it. With this love that he has shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I pray that you will not be the same again as you meditate these words and understand the sheer magnitude, the immensity and the intensity of the Father's love for you. I pray that this love will explode on your inside. It will explode. And as it explodes, it will melt away all symptoms of identity crisis. Melt away all inferiority. Melt away all uncertainty about destiny. And all you will see is the glory that is the destiny that he planted in you before the foundation of the world. I pray that for you in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. We give you praise. Lift your hands and worship. Thank you, Father.